Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Praveen, a postdoctoral, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at uh, uh, Princeton University working with uh, Jennifer Exford. And today with uh, special excitement, I'm pleased to welcome Shabaj and Yunatan and Lalit, uh, a very special guest joining us uh, to our P4 Expert Roundtable series. Uh, Shabaj is a postdoc in the uh, WE department at uh, Stanford University. Uh, and his research is mainly uh, focused on the design and development of uh, uh, domain-specific uh, abstractions, compilers, and architectures for emerging work layers, uh, including machine learning and self-driving networks. Um, and Shabas received uh, his PhD and MA in computer science from Princeton University and BE in uh, computer engineering from National University of Sciences and Technology. And uh, we have other special guest, uh, Yonathan, is a research software engineer at uh, Melano at, in the advanced development team at uh, uh, Melanox. Uh, his main focus is uh, uh, research digits on uh, programmable switches, hardware offload of network functions, and uh, data center network design. And Yonathan holds a BSc in physics and electrical engineering from Tel Aviv University, and MSc in physics from Wishman Institute of Science. And today, both will be sharing with us their learning experience and expert opinion on implementing ELMO, a source-based uh, multicast routing using Melanox switches. With that, uh, I ask that uh, you give your full attention and hand over the session to Shahbaz and Yonatan. Please. All right. Thanks, Praveen. So let me just share my screen. All right. So yeah, so like Praveen said, so my name is Shabaz and today I'm going to talk about our work on realizing source hardware multicast using Melanox's programmable hardware switches. So it's a joint work with uh, folks from multiple places like Melanox, VMware, and Stanford. And in the first half of the, half of the talk, uh, it's gonna be me talking about giving you an overview of what ELMO is, like the source hardware multicast scheme that we implemented. And then Jonathan is gonna talk about how we implemented that using the Melanox programmable switches. So the thing is, group communication is quite pervasive in public clouds today. If you look at these public clouds such as Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, today these data centers and these public clouds host tens of thousands of tenants, each of which may be running hundreds of workloads. And these workloads can be anything between replication for databases and state machines to publish subscribes using technologies like ZeroMQ and RabbitMQ, and also infrastructure apps that companies like VMware, NSX, and OpenStack have built to allow overlay networks to run on top of the physical, infra uh, physical data center infrastructure. So if you look at these workloads and the environment that you're running in, which is a public cloud, the number of distinct group communication that can actually happen in these environments can actually e easily exceed millions of, uh, millions of groups. So the question that we asked was like, okay, how can we enable support for these large number of groups communication that are taking place in a public cloud? Because if you look at the existing implementations that we have today for native multicast, they're actually quite limited in a, in a number of different ways. For example, we only have a limited number of state in these switches that we have today in public clouds. They can only host uh, more like less than 10,000 entries. And also because we are being maintained by data center controller, it leads to a lot of uh, churn, control churn. What I mean by that is whenever a membership changes, or whenever a topology changes due to a link failure on a new node uh, that is connected to the, to, the, to the data center, it causes the data center controller to kick in and update the policy in these switches for these multicast communications that are taking place in a public cloud. And also because of that, it leads to a lot of processing overhead on the data center controller. So clearly, the, the sort of the limitations of existing native multicast uh, implementations we have today, they are actually limited by are bounded by the amount of state that you can maintain in a data center. So they're not, they're not scalable in terms of the state that you need to maintain multicast in today's public cloud. So because of that, what happens today is tenants that are running on these public clouds are forced to uh, use application level multicast. And what I mean by that is if you have an application with, with there is one publisher and it needs to send traffic to or messages to uh, three subscribers, it's the responsibility of the publisher to open up these unicast connections with all these subscribers and then send individual messages to each of them. So in this case, you can clearly see there can be a lot of processing overhead on the publisher because that's the, 
entity that is generating multiple copies of the packets and sending them individually to these uh, receivers. And then there can be a lot of traffic overhead because you're sending the same amount of bytes again and again over the network to multiple destinations. And finally, because as you increase the number of subscribers, it adds loads or load on the publisher to make more and more copies for the messages. The, the final throughput that a given subscriber sees actually like sort of load, like it goes down as you increase the number of subscribers. So in the case of application multicast then is like the bottleneck is the performance. You're not able to run at the full line rates that are available in today's public clouds. So the question that we asked in this case was, how can we enable support for native multicast that allows you to sort of scale beyond the limitations of the state that you have in today's implementations of native multicast while still being able to run at line weight. So for that, what we did was we looked into the idea of like source alert of multicast, multicast and we implemented a scheme called ELMO, uh, which appeared in SIGCOM last year. And uh, now, so what happened in, in ELMO is, if you look at the data center again, instead of maintaining state inside these switches for group communication, uh, which is actually maintained as a sort of a couple of like, okay, as a, as a rule table entry in these switches, which matches on a group ID and then selects the number of ports on each of these switches where the packet has to go out to. So what is happening here is like, you are, you are storing a group ID in these switches, which is a shared state. And then you're using that group ID to decide where you have to send the packet. So rather than doing this, what if we can move this sort of multicast policy inside the packet and then maintain it as a list of switch ID and a port bitmap. So what I mean by that is rather than using group ID in each of these switches to decide where you have to go, what if we can encode this inside a packet and then for each of the switches that are participating in the multicast tree, we have a switch ID that the switch can match on from within the packet and then decide which ports it needs to send out to. And the way we encode this sort of the port mapping for each of these switches is using a bit map where each bit in the bitmap specifies which egress port the packet has to go out. And furthermore, in some of the cases, it may not be possible to sort of encode all the switches as a tuple inside a packet because of the limited header space we have in these packets. We come up with an idea of a default bitmap, which is like when a packet arrives at a particular switch, if the switch is not able to see its ID in the packet, then it can just use the default bitmap. And what the default bitmap does is that it ensures that the switch will be able to send packets out to at least the number of ports that it needs to send out to for a particular tree. And while maybe sending traffic to some other, some, some other extraneous ports that may not be in the tree. But it will always ensure that the packet always goes out on the, on the ports that are actually participating in the tree for that, uh, for, uh, on that particular switch. Furthermore, what we do is we actually partition this sort of uh, policy that we're encoding in the packet into two parts. One is the upstream P rules, the rules that you that switches will read upon when they are going up, uh, when the traffic is sorry, when the message is traversing up into the topology. And the second, our uh, second one, like the second part, is the downstream P rules when the packet is actually coming down into the topology. To give you an idea, so what happens like when a publisher is sending a a, a message out to the three subscribers that we have in this figure, uh, when going upstream the switches will read the upstream P rules. And then when coming downstream, the switch will see whether there's a P rule for me in that header or not. And if there is a P rule, it will use that P rule to route the packets, or it will look at the default bitmap to send the packet out to the, uh, out of the given uh, destination ports on that switch. And then the packet will finally reach the final destination. So this is the underlying sort of mechanism of what El we are, what we, what Elmo is doing is like, it's taking all the state from within the switches and moving it in, into the packets, thus making it local to that particular packet. And in, by doing so, what happens like, now you can actually scale to like a large number of different groups because it's rather than using the shared state in the switch, now the state is being maintained locally within each packet of an application. So from here onward, I'll actually hand off to Jonathan to talk about how we implemented this policy or this scheme uh, using the Manalox programmable switches. So off to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Shabazz. Let me know when you see my screen. Yep, we can see your screen. Second. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Jonathan and I will discuss the implementation of Elmo and Nomonox programmable switches. Nomonox programmable switch follow a hybrid model in which programmable pipelines can be inserted in between fixed function pipelines, thus having like this port bridge or router, for example, thus having legacy functionality network OS user application run in parallel. These programmable pipelines are expressed in P4, compiled off boxes in our compiler and can be injected to the switch in runtime. First, in order to implement Elmo, we needed to build the parser state machine, and it is shown here. Quickly going over it, we start from the VXLAN GPE state, which can, we can transition us <coughs> either to the upstream PUL or the downstream PUL. From the UP state, we can extract the UP bitmap and go either to the DP or to the inner header parsing. The DP state parsing is built from two states, one to parse the base header, and the other one pass, passes the DP bitmap and default bitmap, as shown in this diagram. The state is passed with a TLV parser or option parser, which was the main part of the implementation of the parser done in this work. So we'll go into more details now. We try to build an option parser as generic as possible to be added to our programmable switches. And for that, we try to look at how options are used as we know they are common among network protocols like IP and TCP. <coughs> we can notice the options usually follow a common structure in which the base header has some known length. The total header length can be computed from a header field. And from this, the total length of the option is calculated and passed to the option parser, so it will know how many bytes needs to be parsed. The options themselves are built in a TLV fashion, where each option has a type, which is a self-indicator, as opposed to next header fields in normal headers. It has a length field in some granularity, so in principle, you need to perform some arithmetic on it. And lastly, it can have the value of the TLV option. Length and type fields have fixed size and offset for all the options of a given base header, so they are property of the option parser itself. This is done mainly to support unknown options, so if the parser doesn't recognize the type field and cannot pass the value, it can still know how many bytes needs to be skipped according to the length field. Straight transition is defined in the base header once again to support unknown options. So how is it related to us? In Elmo, we consider the downstream peer rules uh, as options. And we can look at the right side of the screen for an example of the packet header format defined for this work. The base header consists of the next protocol to pass and the number of peer rules, which is exactly the total length of the options when multiplied by 64 bits. Each option has a fixed length. So in this case, we didn't use a length field, but in the general case, it can exist. And the type is the switch ID. So the switch ID is, used, is, used, <coughs> is considered as the option type. If the parser recognizes its own switch ID, it can pass the DP bitmap. Unknown switch IDs, so all the other switches, uh, will be disregarded by the parser and just skip. Lastly, we chose to implement the default peer rule by having a well-known switch ID common to all switches in the net. So we don't need another field for it. After the parser, we can have a look at the pipeline and how does a single switch in the network function. It looks first at the upstream bitmap. If it was passed successfully, it will agree to these ports. If it is invalid, it will look for the downstream bitmap. And it is the responsibility of the switch start that starts the downstream path to invalidate the upstream header. So the downstream will be passed by the, by the relevant switches. If UP and DP bitmaps are not found by the parser, the switch will egress to the default PWL bitmap, which is a mechanism to increase the scale of the multicast group on the expense of excess traffic, as Shabazz explained just earlier. Lastly, if none found, the switch will continue normal forwarding by the legacy pipeline, for example, for non elmo packets, which traverse this, the switch. Now let's have a look at the demo. We build the following three switch tree topology, consisting of two leaves and one spine. All of them spectrum two programmable switches. We connected six hosts to the topology and performed no configuration of the switches other than the switch ID registers used by the parser. So we needed that this leaf one will know is leaf one, this spine will know is spine, etc. In the demo, we demonstrate different packets sent by the transmitter, H1, with different Elmo headers having different forwarding rules. For example, the first packet will only contain UP header will not egress to the spine. While the second example will consist both of UP and DP and will show multiple group across leaves. Two other examples are present. One of them will be used in the default peer only. So we'll see the entire functionality. So now we can see the real demo video. Four different packets will be sent by the transmitter H1 in the top left corner. And for example, the first one will only be received by H2. The second one will be received by three other receivers. 
etc. This, so, this shows actually the implementation of multiple multicast groups without having any state on the switches and putting all the state in the hypervisor as needed by the Elmo protocol. Next, in the following slides, I would like to share some of our experience from this work of implementing Elmo. And the first is multicast. Multicast is not handled by the PSA model. Instead, it is treated externally. A multicast group table is implicitly defined in the language. This hinders the, in the architecture, sorry. This hinders the ability to implement Elmo, which is a stateless switch multicast. So to tackle it, we implemented on our programmable switches direct exposure of multicast bitmap to the data plane. This is the way it looks like in P4, just the metadata defined by the switch architecture. This model can also support the existing multicast group table by simply explicitly adding another table to the pipeline. And the last bullet is just a remark that in a hybrid uh, architecture, in principle, some of the ports uh, can be non-physical ports, uh, like router interface, etc. Option parser, as we discussed previously, are possible to implement in current P4. And we actually looked at a few implementation, it is, but it is not very trivial to do or easily offloadable to the hardware. And we feel that, that since this is a common use case, it might be worthwhile to have a standard way to define it, hopefully a way that is easily offloaded by the different hardware vendors. What we suggest or what we started working on, and it is a work in progress, is building a sub parser prototype which can be used, which will use the observed structure that we shown in the second slide. And the lastly, extractions, which are defined in the core library, act on entire headers. It consumes them and advances the, the cursor. It is further assumed that the algorithm will extract all the fields of the accepted header, but doing so could be costly in terms of the size of memory that needs to be carried along the pipeline. So for example, in, in our case, you can see this uh, down DP header, and we will need to carry this entire header multiplied by the number of pills. But actually sometimes you only require a single field, like this bitmap needs for the forwarding. The other fields are used by the parser. <coughs> and so this may prevent some hardware optimization of selective extraction, especially in dynamically loaded control, which could be separate for the parser in principle. And also this make it, makes it hard to implement some advanced field extraction features like variable offset fields, which is used in this work and also in SRV6, for example. So to tackle this in our programmable switch architecture, we implemented field extraction primitives and defined the, defined the following in our architecture. For example, you can extract a single regular field, a variable offset field, or even a variable offset variable size field. These primitives extract a single field and advance the cursor, skipping everything in the middle. And they add to the current ender primitives, which were already implemented, this kind of definition is also useful for variable offset fields or even to do more than one variable length field in the header, which is currently unsupported. Uh, we also looked at another option to, to perform this optimization uh, using static usage analysis done in the compiler backend. And this approach actually could be sufficient for monolithic P4 executable, uh, but it poses some problems when trying to build an architecture which allows dynamic insertion of control pipelines which are the same parser, which we try to do sometimes. Uh, so to conclude, Elmo compactly encodes multicast policy inside packets while removing state from the switches. It is designed for multi-tenant data centers and it scales accordingly. It was demonstrated here for the first time with wire speed performances in a hybrid programmable data plane while keeping all legacy forwarding and control plane intact. Thank you very much for listening. And I would also like to acknowledge the people listed here who contributed to this work, either with the paper or the implementation. Thanks a lot. Uh, Praveen, you are mute. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for delivering such a wonderful talk, uh, Shabaj and uh, Yonatan. Um, so, uh, that's very interesting, like the way how the state that is displayed across switches is uh, um, mapped, is kept in the packet and uh, deliver the packet, deliver the, how to implement the multicast policy. Uh, it's very interesting. So I have a couple of questions on, uh, you know, for the general audience and for, uh, uh, for the, you know, for the discussion. Uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, uh, you know, some, if you can provide some insights on, uh, how multicast in cloud environments is different from traditional IP multicast in enterprise or wide area networks. So how do you, how do you see what's a, 
what are the major differences uh, so i can i can take a first stab at it like so in terms of the, the implementation like ip multicast uh, the mechanism from a switch point of view either in the wide area or within a data center is same like it matches on a group id and then it routes on a on a particular set of interfaces i think uh, so that's why most of the people have tried to use the native ip multicast approaches within the data center as well because the overall like api that is exposed by the switches is basically the same what they need the problem is and so there are two things happening here one there's because of the scale of the public cloud the existing schemes do not scale uh, within the data center so state is very limited and second unlike wide area network data center has this sort of domain specific sort of uh, aspect to it like the structure of the topology the symmetric nature of like how the switches are connected to each other that helps us exploit uh, these sort of uh, insights and then come up with a very efficient encoding that allowed us to map like the state from within the switches inside the packet. So if you're trying to do the same thing in a wide area, wide area has a very sort of random topology structure. It's going to be very hard to come up with an efficient encoding to do sort of the kind of the IP multicast we did using Elmo. So I that's the basic, that's I think the major difference between the two. So I'm just wondering do you, if you think uh, if the topology is uh, kind of is known in advance in a, yeah. an autonomous system, uh, so would uh, would that make uh, life easy to deploy Elmo in uh, wide area networks? So, so the thing is, like, it's not just knowing in advance; it's the structure and the symmetric sort of nature of the topology as well. So, for you can still have a jellyfish in a data center or a random topology in a data center, and you may know what the structure of that topology is. But then the question is, like, does that topology enable sort of the kind of uh, compression mechanisms or the kind of the ways we are trying to sort of the sort of map multiple switches to the single sort of uh, uh, rule and so forth. So those kind of like aggregations are they are these possible? And they are typically possible because, for example, in a class topology, you have a core switch, and we know that no matter which ports which we go out to, we always take the same egress port, so we can just maintain one state inside the packet for it. So right. these are the things that we need to know. And even if we know the topology up front, if your topology is not letting us do this kind of sort of optimization, the final sort of uh, encoding that you're putting on a packet might be too large to encode using the current packet sizes we have. I understand. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and I assume multicast is uh, uh, already supported in today's cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, so how is it implemented uh, today, and uh, what are its what are its limitations? Right. And right. How realizing uh, you know Elmo using Mullock switches would address those uh, limitations? Can you give some insights on that? Yeah, so just like what I mentioned in the talk is today, if you look at a public cloud, mm -hmm. pretty much all of them, you have to rely on application level multicast. Like it's the responsibility of the tenant or the person who is writing an application and running it on top of a public cloud who has to do multicast himself. There's no underlying mechanism or hardware support from the data center to do this. So this is how it is implemented today. And it's very slow. So that's why we see that there a lot of the use cases like financial industry and so forth that want to move on to a public cloud cannot actually move because of these sort of limitations uh, that we have in multicast today. So, so the thing like if you want to do it using the hardware based multicast, then I, as I mentioned in the talk, nobody enables it because there's a lot of overhead. First, there is limited state. Second, it's not just state, it's also the amount of control traffic that you're pushing in the network. So again, these data center providers, they want to maintain the network and have a tight control on the kind of traffic that is flowing through it. But by having multicast and like not knowing, okay, a change happens and then you now just have to go through all these switches and update them, there's a lot of overhead. And it's not efficient for them to implement it in that way. So one of the work with Elmo was to sort of reduce that overhead, the control churn, uh, by moving state within the package. I see. Interesting. Yeah. So I can I can connect this uh, the scalability issue that you just mentioned about application level doing doing multicast at the application level. So I was uh, you know uh, wondering how today people support uh, uh, large webinars. Uh, you know, with uh, many people like fifty with uh, with the audience in the number of order of k thousand. Yeah. So how do they support such uh, one to many companies? But uh, yeah, but we can discuss that offline. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and also, um, what can you comment on the Elmo's uh, deployment strategy in the cloud? Yeah. Uh, 
and your observations, and especially in a network using legacy switches. Right. right. So again, uh, I think for Elmo to operate, you still need sort of these new hardware features that we are sort of we discussed in the talk, and that's why we are using Mellanox programmable switch. Uh, with the legacy switches, what you can do is like just like you have these sort of uh, racks of sort of or pods of uh, switches and servers are doing something specific like load balancing and so forth. So you may actually set up something like this where you say, okay, so a certain part of the network is programmable. Mm -hmm. And so within that part of the network, if you want to like sort of run your multicast applications, try to place them in that part of the network. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do want to go to the legacy part, we do have these mechanisms. The packet is still carrying the group ID within itself. Mm -hmm. So legacy switches can still match on that group ID and use the group tables that they have to route the packet uh, within the network. But then again, it will it will cause a limitation in terms of scale. But they will still be interoperable. You can still operate between them. Uh, operate using the legacy switches. Okay, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it seems uh, Elmo requires uh, some kind of encoding going on at the hypervisor level, right? So mm -hmm. given the trend, uh, especially um, in the large cloud providers, uh, where uh, as as the network interface card line rates are increasing to save CPU cycles and reduce latency, uh, they are looking toward, you know, they're already moved some of the network functions to hardware-based accelerators. Yeah. And uh, so how Elmo works in such environments, can you comment on challenges posed if somebody wants to implement Elmo at the, at the using hardware-based accelerators or smart using smart things or any other? Yeah, sure, sure. So let me first define like the role of hypervisor switches and the core switches. So again, core switches are within the within the network. They are being shared across all the servers that you have. So they need to maintain state for all of them. So again, if you're doing multicast, all the switches in the network need to maintain this that state and it's a shared state. So all the tenants will be contending for that state. By, by, by being on the hypervisor switches, the thing is, first of all, you are narrowing down the scope of the, 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 the sort of the, uh, they're not being now shared by all of them because only the VMs that are running on a particular server will need to maintain state in these hypervisor switches. So for example, when I say a group ID comes in and I need to encode the header on top of it, that hypervisor switch that is running in that server only needs to maintain these encodings for the VMs or the application running on that server. But if you are doing anything with the network switches, these switches need to sort of maintain state for all the servers and all the applications that are running in a, in a data center. Right. So, so the thing is with that, like, first of all, I think, so that is the part where hypervisor switches become pretty interesting because they're scalable now because you can just add more and more servers and then uh, the corresponding hypervisor switches on those servers will start supporting these uh, new mappings that they need to support. Uh, then again, the point is like, okay, to your question on like, what if we are, these hypervisor switches are moving to um, hardware accelerators like smart mix and so forth. I think again, with respect to doing this whole idea of like maintaining state, even if you're going to smart mix, my understanding is like given the amount of applications that are running on a server, a single server on that particular server, these smart mix will be able to maintain state for those applications. So that is the main difference. Like instead of like, if you are sitting in a network, then you have to maintain state for all the applications in a data center. But you have, if you're running on a server, like on a hypervisor, it doesn't matter whether you're running as a software switch or a hardware switch, the amount of state that you need to maintain is much smaller than if you're running within a network. So my understanding is like, even if you're moving towards smart mix, they will still be able to, they will have the necessary state that they need to maintain uh, or support Elmo uh, in, in a large public cloud. Um, yeah, one thing is uh, state, I understand. What about the comp computation? Uh, so the computation part is very simple. Just like these smart mix, they're already doing like VXLAN, header encoding and decoding. So yeah. Elmo is just like another header, like they just encode that header on top of the packet. So we are not doing anything complicated because the, eventually what you're installing is a rule in, a, in these hardware accelerators that match on a group ID and then they have to sort of encapsulate certain bytes on the packet. And mm -hmm. they're already doing it for VXLAN. So this is just a new protocol and they just need to encode on the packet. All the computation that is needed to generate those bytes is done at the controller. I see. Yeah. Um, so while I was listening to your talk, I, I have, uh, I got this, uh, um, the, basically what I understand the core idea was to take the uh, state out of switches and uh, put it into individual packets. Uh, right. right. So uh, when you're doing that, uh, 
do you see any bandwidth overhead in, in the network uh, when you are processing these packets in the in the yeah. network? Yeah. So comment on what kind of bandwidth overhead that you have observed. Yeah. So so the, the thing if you, yeah so in our evaluation what we found was like if you are doing application level multicast, so compared to an ideal multicast where you you are just sending the exact amount of bytes to the right destinations and you're not doing and you're not sending any extra bytes in the network so we call this an ideal multicast like the ideal way of sending a, a multicasting a packet within a device so compared to that implementation if you are doing application level multicast the amount of byte, extra bytes that you are sending in the network because you are sending a same packet again and again is 400% you are sending 400% more bytes within a network to do a multicast which if you do ideally will be that much less uh, so compared to this, these two extreme, like ideal multicast and application level multicast, with Elmo using the techniques and things that we implemented, we are only adding five percent overhead. So way less than four hundred percent that you're seeing. So there is still some overhead because of the default bitmap that we are using, uh, but still the overall overhead is much smaller. And the other thing that we do within with with these programmable switches is like as you move along within your topology, we throw away all the bytes that have been read by a particular switch because we know that within a topology, these bytes are no longer needed by the next switch or the set of switches that are coming ahead. So that, that the previous switch will simply decapsulate them from the packet. Right. So by the time you reach the final destination, you don't have any header on the packet anywhere. I understand, yeah. yeah. Interesting, that's very interesting. And uh, good, up, you know, uh, having less overhead is always good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and uh, another thing, have you shared the lessons uh, that you've learned in implementing uh, Elmo using Analog switches uh, uh, to the program to the P4 program language design group. Uh, I think if if you're not if you haven't, uh, maybe this is the perfect time to suggest any changes to the uh, yeah. P4 language group. Uh, so please share that. I think I'll let Jonathan answer this. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I uh, totally agree. Uh, we have not shared it yet, uh, so we decided. We actually talked about it the last time, and we decided to take the time until the talk to really refine the lessons learned and the statements we want to state and. Actually, we would be really glad to continue this discussion over the, in the relevant working group for each of the one of the challenges we encountered. Okay. So, so shortly, no, but we'll do. <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, uh, anything that, uh, uh, that the current P4 ecosystem uh, is not uh, sufficient or um, to implement some of the Elmo functionality in the Melanox switches, have you observed anything, any sort of like that? For the research community to work on, uh, if you have observed anything. Mm -hmm. So regarding the, 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 the challenges, it's exactly like we talked in the, in the like, like in my talk, what I mentioned, it's really mostly the multicast and the exposure of it to the, to the data plane and, and all sorts of different optimization. We found that it was kind of difficult for us to do. Mm -hmm. So, I think everything is, is on the table and this is an open language and everyone can share their opinion. And I think uh, we might have not gotten the, the best solution. We would be glad to share what we, what we have and, and get the feedback and continue to improve the language. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if the speakers like to add anything else, uh, uh, if, if, there isn't, if, there's not, uh, if there's not much, then... I can stop the session. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful conversation and wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for me. Bye.